Hey everybody, this is Peter Diamandis. Uh, welcome to our Human Longevity Inc. Health Nucleus webinar. It's a, uh, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for spending uh, part of your day with us. This is obviously a critically important uh, conversation uh, for all of us uh, during our lifetimes. It's actually the very first time that we're able to talk about a revolution in healthcare that's coming. Uh, driven by genomics and by data science. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to share this first and foremost with my community, those of you who've been following my work and uh, reading our blogs and care about exponential technologies. I'm very proud to be joined by Dr. Brad Perkins. Uh, Brad has become a friend, but first and foremost, he's the uh, Chief Medical Officer of, of Human Longevity, Inc. And just a, well, first of all, welcome, Brad. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to be here. Great Thank to have you, you pal. Um, a little bit about Brad, just to provide some context, uh, besides being a, a visionary and a physician who's as passionate about reinventing the future of healthcare as I am and Craig and, and Bob Hariri, uh, before joining us, uh, Craig was the, uh, I, I, uh, Brad was the executive vice president uh, for strategy and innovation and the chief transformation officer, I love that term, uh, at Vanguard Health Systems. And uh, they were 46,000 person company, uh, pretty amazing. Vanguard did uh, amazing work in the healthcare world. Uh, before that, um, he was at the Center for Disease Control, uh, CDC, uh, and actually uh, uh, was involved in uh, running the investigation for, uh, for anthrax. Um, he was CDC's chief strategy and information officer uh, and uh, managed an $11.2 billion budget. <laughs> You could do some real good damage with eleven point two billion dollars, <laughs> but uh, you've joined us now to really right. to reinvent healthcare, and uh, for that I'm grateful. Yeah, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, um, so uh, let's uh, let's begin. Uh, we're going to talk about what we're doing at Human Longevity, and uh, in specific uh, the health nucleus. Uh, and uh, if I could, I'll, I'll start by a little bit of context. And as I said in in the blog. Uh, this, what we're doing at Human Longevity at the Health Nucleus right now is really only possible today in, it is the sort of the culmination or the recombination of rapidly falling genomic sequencing prices down from a uh, hundred million dollars, which what Craig spent in 2001 down to under a thousand dollars today. It's the convergence of machine learning technology and uh, really computational crunching power, bandwidth for transmitting petabytes of data and storing petabytes of data. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about at Human Longevity, and I'll refer to some of these slides as we go through, it's not just about living longer, it's about a, a healthier and uh, productive extended lifespan. Um, the company Human Longevity was started uh, by myself, uh, Craig Venter, uh, who sequenced the first life form, sequenced uh, the first uh, human himself, all 3.2 billion letters, raced the NIH to the punch and, and beat them there. And Dr. Bob, uh, Bob Hariri, who's our third co-founder, who's a world's expert in stem cell science. And I think, uh, uh, Brad, when you joined us, uh, this was your, your, your vision and your mission. You want to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. We've put together the health nucleus for, for two major reasons. The first is to provide an example, an early prototype of what we think health and healthcare are going to look like in the information environment, in the new information environment that we're actually creating at Human Longevity. Secondly, we've put together a suite of um, medical devices and, and measurement technologies that we think ideally complement the whole genome sequencing that we're doing at Human Longevity to provide a personalized um, health risk assessment and then to build um, an individual care plan around that personal health risk assessment. Yeah, so if you look about it, if you think about it, for all of human history, uh, the last couple of years, last couple of, of decades, centuries even, uh, medicine has always been uh, you know, reactive uh, disease management, generalized costly. It's been sick care by anything else. And when you go to the hospital and you show up with uh, a cancer or heart disease or neurodegenerative disease and you say, oh my God, 
it just didn't happen to you that morning, right? It's been going on for some time. And a lot of what we're doing at Human Longevity is how do we actually predict what's likely to happen to you and catch it before it happens so we can stop it in its tracks. And the vision that you and your team are working on is really you know, proactive, preventative, personalized, predictive. So it massively drops the cost down and drops the impact of disease. I mean, that's really your, your vision. Yeah, well, there's a, a couple of very important dynamics at play here. The first is um, a tremendous success. Over the last 150 years, we've actually doubled human life expectancy. But one of the consequences of that success is now we're confronted with a fundamentally new challenge in the form of age-related chronic diseases. And that takes a new, new toolbox and a new approach that the current healthcare system is poorly designed to deliver. So what we're doing is rethinking how health and healthcare should be delivered in, in an environment that's being shaped by, by new science and technologies. Um, and, and that's gonna allow us to sort of eclipse um, the largely reductionistic symptom-driven uh, process for healthcare and enter, enter a realm where taking care of your health actually becomes much more similar to managing your wealth portfolio than what healthcare looks like today. Peter. Yeah, I, mean, I like to say, you know, I, I drive a Model S and a Model X and I fly an SR-22 airplane and both of those vehicles have hundreds of sensors and hundreds of microprocessors monitoring their health. And as soon as anything goes out a little bit out of whack, uh, I get, actually, I don't even get the reports. Uh, Tesla's headquarters gets the reports and tells me something is going on. And that's the way we view human longevity is gonna be sort of your, uh, your big brother, I don't, that's, I got a negative connotation, but <laughs> monitoring what's going on with you to predict what's likely to come happen and stop it in the first place. And one of the ways that we're doing this is we have built uh, over the last two years since we founded the company, the world's largest genome sequencing facility uh, down in La Jolla. Um, we, uh, are, we built the capability, we're on target, if you would, to sequence uh, on the order of 100,000 genomes in the next year. Uh, we just signed a deal for 500,000 genomes with AstraZeneca, one of the large healthcare providers. And uh, with a target of a million to five million genomes by 2020, when I say genomes, this is not 23andMe that, mil that measures a million SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. We're talking about not a million, but all 3.2 billion letters of your life. A little bit different. Yeah. And Peter, as you know, um, a typical um, individual will have around 4.1 million different variations in their genome. And human longevity is committed to attaching meaning to all of those variations and putting them into the context of health and the delivery of healthcare. But we're at a tipping point right now because traditionally the doctor has been the computer and the person that assembles all this information. Um, you can easily appreciate that when we start talking about you as a unique individual with 4.1 million variants, all of which affect how your health and, and healthcare should be delivered, we're gonna have to rely on computer power, machine learning, um, and essentially cognify a stream of intelligence to support doctors to deliver this information in fundamentally new ways. So um, I just wanna point this out again. One of the things that we do is really truly sequence all 3.2 billion uh, letters of your life. In fact, when we sequence you, uh, we don't sequence you once, we sequence you 30 times. We do the all 3.2 billion letters 30 times. And by repeating it 30 times, we actually get rid of any aberrations that are statistically coming out of the sequencing machine. So it's a level of sequencing uh, that is far beyond any other uh, you know, sequencing company that, that we know of. Um, the facility that Dr. Perkins and uh, uh, Pam Brar, Dr. Ba Pam Brar, uh, oversee in La Jolla is called our Health Nucleus. We've built this as our prototype facility. Eventually, we'll have these kinds of facilities around the world. Our very first one is in La Jolla. You can see it here. It's a it's a beautiful uh, beautiful facility, and 
uh, when people join us, and we, we're just now in our beta phase, we've just gotten our first 200 people through the health nucleus, uh, and we're beginning to write the reports and the results. I'll be sharing those with you shortly. And now we are, later this summer, going to be opening up the health nucleus to the general public. Uh, this is something I'm proud of to give my community a chance to participate first before anybody else. Um, I had my Abundance 360 community actually have access to it uh, over a year ago, and they represented our first 200 people through the health nucleus, now opening it up to the next uh, level of my community, those of you who, uh, who get our, our weekly blogs. And I want to share, if you would, uh, some of these stats, but Brad, you know these better. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is a really important statistic uh, for everyone to understand. We all, we all like to feel like we're gonna be above average um, in, in just about every endeavor, but, but um, particularly average human life expectancy, which is around 78 currently in the United States. But it turns out that the risk of dying before you reach that age is, 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 is uh, reasonably high. And in adult males in the United States right now, uh, the risk of dying between the ages of 50 and 74 years is, of age is 30%. It's a little bit lower in women, but we think this is a number that we can move um, in a positive direction with the, with the uh, methods and protocols we put in place in the health nucleus. So um, if you take a look, what we are effectively doing when you enter the health nucleus is digitizing you. Uh, we are collecting 150 gigabytes of data uh, about you, um, and we'll show you what data we're collecting. And this is a level of data collected in a structured format that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can actually crunch the numbers on uh, that has never existed before. Um, and you know, we're going to go through this a little bit. On the right here, you see a whole giant list. I think this is the, the key number I want to just point out. It's a huge amount. And again, it's just now that we can really uh, upload that much data at volume and then manipulate that data and then have our machine learning team, which I'll speak about in a little bit, crunch that data. Um, but uh, uh, Brad, when, when someone uh, joins up on Health Nucleus, I'm going to ask you to describe what they go through. But before I do, let me just mention, I really want everybody here, we're going to be speaking for about another 15 minutes and then really do half an hour of Q&A. So I would like you to be adding your questions and upvoting the ones that you think are best so that we can really uh, uh, answer your most direct questions. Uh, at the top of your screen, you'll see little nine squares. If you click on that, on the left hand, you'll then see uh, a Q&A button. And if you click on the Q&A, you can ask your questions, see the other questions there, vote questions up, and this will make it much more fulfilling and interactive, and, you know, and thank you for tuning in uh, live with us. So, so Brad, we have an eight-hour day um, uh, that when people come into the health nucleus, and we are, I will just say right now, we're very restricted. We are able to process only six to eight people a day. We'll be expanding facilities later, but today, uh, Mr. Abundance here is uh, is kind of scarcity model on this, but we'll be we'll be growing it over time. But what happens uh, before people come during the eight hours and afterwards? So, Peter, it's important to recognize that this is uh, the nucleus experience as it's currently constructed is a year long experience. Um, it starts by getting registered and scheduling um, a day long visit in the health nucleus in La Jolla. Um, but actually we spend a great deal of time working with our clients before they arrive, uh, collecting important past medical history, um, working with them to understand the, um, uh, what their experience in La Jolla is going to look like, and then actually having them arrive, and it's a full eight hour day. And then after that visit, we begin to deliver results back to them. Um, that process culminates at, at a point where we sort of get everything integrated. And it's important to recognize that this is the first time this level of data has ever been integrated to assess, assess health risk in, in humans. 
So we're, we're still in the development process of that and, and getting great feedback from our clients about uh, what's most useful to them and their physicians. So throughout this process, we work with your primary care physician. Um, the, the year long experience culminates in a individualized care plan uh, that, we then, that we then sort of offer an opportunity to, to continue to follow up with us or to, to work with that care plan uh, with your physician. So just to take you through, you'll in advance uh, do a, there's a medical survey uh, we'll be taking when you come to the facility during your eight hour day in La Jolla. Uh, there are, uh, we're gonna be taking a set of, of bloods and running lab. Uh, you'll be meeting with our physician and you'll be uh, during that time uh, being clear about what it is your expectations are. Uh, we'll be doing a whole genome scan. Again, all 3.2 billion letters of your life uh, are gonna be sequenced. And if you come as a family, uh, that's even better where you've got your parents and you. Um, we measure your metabolism. What is the metabolism? Yeah, so metabolomics is a great complement to the whole genome sequence and the microbiome that we're also measuring. And metabolomics gives us um, an untargeted survey of the small chemicals and molecules that are circulating in your blood. About how many of those? About 1,500 of those metabolites we can now measure with a great deal of precision. Um, and that allows us to look at um, um, metabolites that are being produced by bacteria specifically, as well as um, metabolites that are being produced by your human, human cells under the direction of your genome. Uh, we then do uh, echo and EKG. We do uh, coronary CT. So we basically look at your heart, your heart function, your heart vasculature to make sure and understand, because cardiovascular is one of the leading causes of death. So it's uh, really critically important. Um, body composition, what do we? Yeah, so one of the, one of the, um, one of the uh, precepts that we've used in the, the design of the health nucleus is that 3D imaging techniques, uh, including magnetic resonance imaging, echocardiography, CAT scan, are going to be extremely important um, complements to whole genome sequencing. So we've really emphasized um, those modalities for data collection. They also allow us to explore all the major systems that are involved in age-related chronic diseases. Uh, so we're right now running research protocols that allow us to explore um, metabolic disease uh, by looking specifically at fat content within the body and subcutaneously as well as specifically measuring muscle volume throughout the body. Uh, we look at bone density, uh, which, you know, most people, if you, know, you have a, a, a broken pelvis or, or a, a broken uh, femur and, and you end up in the hospital and that's the hospital is the worst place to be. Uh, then we do a whole body MRI. And this is something that is uh, really critical. As you said, probably the combination of whole genome uh, sequencing and whole body MRI is the, part of the magic sauce here. You want to talk about a whole body MRI? Yeah, so using the whole body MRI, we're doing a couple of things that are critically important. First of all, we're working with, with the major manufacturers of the MRI, as well as private companies and academicians to switch from a quantitative um, interpretation of MR data, um, from a qualitative interpretation of MRI data to quantitative. So for example, in the brain, we actually measure the volume of 20 different neuroanatomical structures. And we're, we can follow changes in the volume of those structures over time. That ends up being critically important to determine um, at very early stages risk for a particular brain diseases. Uh, we're doing the same thing uh, for the rest of the body. We have very sensitive methods to pick up cancer in all the solid organs of the body. We also have uh, methods to uh, detect cardiovascular disease, uh, both at the coronary level um, using CT, um, but also at the larger vascular level uh, to detect things like um, risk for aneurysms in the aorta or actually detecting aneurysms in the brain. 
So one of the things that's pretty amazing is the stat I've seen is that we're using the protocols we're running on this whole body MRI can actually detect cancer at like a two millimeter size of pencil lead. This is uh, what this protocol is looking for is the ratio of nuclear size to cytoplasmic size of these cells. So the cells that are very rapidly dividing as cancers have much more higher proportion of the nucleus to cytoplasm. So they light up uh, on these scans like never before. Uh, we look at uh, brain MRI as quantitatively with neuroquant, brain vasculature. Uh, we look at your lung function, gait and balance, uh, cognitive screening. Uh, we look at home sleep apnea, which is, you know, such one of the most underdiagnosed uh, issues that can lead to a whole slew of problems from cardiovascular to stroke. Uh, one of the things we do is we monitor your cardiovascular rhythms over the course of uh, three to five days. Um, I know we've got lots of questions uh, coming up. Um, and then uh, finally, we look at uh, your microbiome, uh, which is an amazing, uh, amazing thing. You want to talk about microbiome for a second? Sure. That's an uh, exciting new frontier in, in health, again, pioneered by Craig Venter at his institute, first recognized actually in 2006. These are the approximately 30 trillion, uh, mostly bacteria, but other microorganisms that live in and on your body, um, in your stool and intestines particularly. And it turns out that they're going to be vitally important in maintaining human health. They've evolved along with us. Um, and, and we're just at the very beginning of looking at how they contribute to the maintenance um, as well as the deterioration of our health. The way I think about it, when you eat food or you take medicines, those food and medicine are being actually, uh, actually processed and metabolized by the flora, by the bacteria in your gut. And 10% of the chemicals in your bloodstream going through your brain are actually bacterial metabolites. And we're going to find more and more and more that it affects your mood, certain diseases, whether you're skinny, whether you're fat, and just amazingly important. Um, I'm going to run through this very quickly, just so we can get, we have a lot of questions. I want to get to the Q&A quickly. So again, uh, on the, you know, we're getting 150 gigabytes of data from all the tests we're doing, the full body MRI, uh, the, uh, for your whole genome, your microbiome, your metabolites. And what we do with that is that all of your data gets uploaded to the cloud. We're one of the largest users and on Amazon Cloud right now. All of this is under high security. Uh, we have a uh, immense security team at HLI uh, making sure that data is kept as confidential as, as the highest level of standards allow for us. Um, and our team of machine learning experts up in Mountain View, led by a gentleman named Franz Ock, Franz is important for this because he was the head of Google Translate for 10 years at Google. He developed and ran the capability to translate eventually between 100 language pairs, between any two of these 100 languages, a huge amount of, uh, of, of uh, options there. And he's now determined through machine learning how to really translate your 3.2 billion letters. And uh, I mean, I'll give you just one example, which is fun. Uh, he sequenced a thousand people and we took a thousand photographs of their face right. and put that through the machine learning. And we've determined that from a drop of blood, we can now predict a photograph of your face as well as your height, your hair color, your skin color, your age, right. amazing stuff. Uh, and here's the key point because this is a network effects business as we sequence as we put 1,000 people, 10,000, 100,000 people through the health nucleus, every year we learn more and more about you. As our corpus of data gets bigger and bigger, all the work we do on you, we learn and give you updates every year that, oh, we just learned that this gene sequence and this metabolomics and this gene mean actually this for you. So every year, as our database gets bigger and bigger, we learn more and more about you. So I said here, the more people that go through the health nucleus, the more we learn about you. Really important point. The stats, I think these are, are critical, Dr. Perkins. It's like pretty amazing. Out of our first 200 patients, what do you want to tell folks? Yeah, so um, we have identified um, really significant 
and actionable new medical um, information in about a quarter to a third of our first 200 clients. Um, this ranges from uh, things that they should know and be aware of or have followed up all the way to the other end of the spectrum um, to things that need to be urgently addressed like early stage cancers or an abnormality in heart rhythm that may put them at risk for stroke as an example. And these are things that um, because we usually wait in the healthcare system until you have symptoms uh, that we don't normally find in people. And I think that that's one of the biggest value propositions that the health nucleus uh, provides is this early detection um, uh, opportunity before symptoms to develop. And I know a lot of the first 200 people are my personal friends. Uh, and I've received several thank you for saving my life emails. And I say that uh, not as a HLI rep, but as an individual who's been communicated that information directly. Um, so finding in a third uh, significant findings, the other side is peace of mind. I'll give you my personal example. My dad has advanced Alzheimer's. He's 89 years old. And for the longest time, I just assumed that was my fate as well. And I, uh, I got, went through this and found out that um, I'm homozygous, not for the ApoE4 gene, which is concerning, which is high, has a high probability, but I'm homoz homozygous for ApoE3, which has a lower probability of Alzheimer's, which I'm very thankful for and is giving me this peace of mind. And what I've realized that for my father, uh, he was really, it's vascular dementia, and he's had a lot of cardiovascular issues, atrial fibrillation that should have been caught much earlier that led to small um, issues. And so that's given me relief on my future, but made me pay much more attention to my cardiovascular state now versus my, my neurodegenerative state. If that makes sense to you, it changed how I view my future. So really important findings. I had one of our patients who is a physician who in his genome sequence found out he had an eight time higher probability of having ovarian cancer. But he's a guy, he doesn't have ovaries, but his daughter does. So his immediate answer is, okay, I've got to go have my, my daughter checked on that regard. And, and really what we're finding is in 10% of patients have life shortening findings genomically that you need to pay attention to. So it's all about early warning, advanced warning. Um, you know, I won't go into detail here, but you know, out of our first 101 patients, you can think of these as percentages, 37% had issues on MRI, body MRI, 11% on brain MRI, 14% had echoes, 30% on the DEXA scans. Now, here's the point. Uh, these first 100 or 200 patients are all wealthy individuals. Uh, they all have uh, personal health care. It's not like they weren't getting checkups. It's right. just the normal medical system doesn't look at the stuff right. that we're looking at. Um, and I, I, so anyway, that's, um, uh, I think we've repeated on the cardiovascular and the whole genome and the brain neuroquant. Um, I'll, I think I'll pause here and we'll, we'll start asking questions. Anything else okay. you wanna, I, I should say uh, right now that the HLI health nucleus experience um, is a, uh, an, Eight hour commitment in La Jolla in if you if you want to participate. So I want you to think of this webinar as information about where the future is going. Uh, and so that you understand it's all about predictive and preventative based upon your genomics, your metabolomics, your microbiome, your your body MRI. This is enough data to be able to predict where it's going. Eventually we'll be adding wearables onto this to monitor it. So this is a vision of where it's going. Uh, today, it's relatively expensive. Uh, HLI's health nucleus is a $25,000 uh, expense. Uh, we actually spend uh, about $20,000 of that. It's not cheap. Right. Uh, so we're not, we have this huge profit margin. For us, it's about uh, getting to volume to bring the price down eventually. And the price will be coming down over time, like anything, whether the first cell phone or computers are expensive. But um, just want to give that, that data point. Uh, Cody, do you want to? start asking questions. And, and Cody Rapp is here, who many of you know is my right arm here. Yes, we have lots of great questions from, uh, from the viewers. So let's start uh, with one that has been upvoted a lot. Who owns the 150 gigabytes of data? Does the client have control? 
does my insurance company have access? How does this affect insurance in general? Yeah. So one of the unique things that we've done in the health nucleus is, is when you come to visit, um, visit us in La Jolla, we actually uh, collect um, photographic information to, to create an avatar, full body avatar of you, and, and um, load that into an application that allows you to use that avatar as a menu to explore your data. Um, and that includes all the data we collected on the modalities Peter talked to you about, as well as the genomic, the microbiomic, and the metabolomic data. We'll also be using that channel to update you on new information that's relevant to your particular uh, mix of, of health data. So as, as, a new geno as a new gene correlation is discovered, as we right. get more and more data, you'll get a note that says you have right. this gene, which means whatever. Yeah, so we consider that, that our clients own their data and that we're storing it um, uh, at levels of security that would be otherwise unobtainable. Um, we don't share that data with anyone else. Uh, they're free to share that, those data with their physician uh, via the, the iPad app. What we do do is we do machine learning on the corpus of all data, uh, meaning so we're looking to extract uh, information out of eventually uh, millions of genomes. And it's, it's very much akin to what Google does. Google uh, uh, doesn't share your specific searches with people, but what it does do is learn from the corpus of all of the, of the searches that are done. Next question. So next question, at what point will the information from the health nucleus become standard protocol for all health providers? Oh, good question. What's yeah. your thought? No, I love that question. Right now, we're, we're in um, an early um, data collection and research phase um, that's, that's primarily focused on um, learning how to most usefully put all these data together to inform uh, individual health risk and to build these care plans. But that's going to be a very important transition, I think, that will occur over the next several years because um, the building of these health plans around individual risk is not something that's been typically done before, Peter. Yeah. And then actually uh, working with, with people to engage in a fundamentally different way with their health. This is not wait until you have a symptom um, and go see your doctor. This will be an ongoing process of, uh, of data collection and analysis that occurs on a quarterly basis. Um, and we're in the process of designing and building right now the follow-up mechanisms that, that allow people to stay attached to the health nucleus and learn over time about other ways they can, they can learn to take care of their health. I mean, my guess to answer that question specifically is that the results that we're delivering and will be delivering will be so dramatically improved uh, that over the next decade, we're going to see a whole shift uh, of those who can afford it, who have private, private medical, this will become the fundamental way that you do medicine. Yeah. Uh, it just, it's, it's night and day. It's, I, I think it's, it's going to be immoral not to be practicing medicine this way in the future. Cody. So another question about age. What age ranges does the health nucleus currently benefit most? Well, right now we're just working with adults, so people 18 years of age and, and older. We think that what we're doing will have applicable uh, applicability to ages below that, but right now we're just working with adults. And I think there's a great deal of value of, of, um, of visiting and getting baseline data at really any age uh, above 18 years of age. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the point. The way we think about this is, when you enter the health nucleus, we digitize you, right? And your genome and your, all that data becomes baseline for you. And then uh, we will be rolling out sort of a continuity care, which we're not going to sequence you every year. We're probably not going to do your full body MRI every year. We're going to, but based upon what we find, we're going to give you a longevity plan that says, you know, uh, you should do a full body MRI every three years based upon your probabilities of cancer, or you should do echocardiogram every five years based upon what we have found. So we'll give you a sort of a longevity care. So when you enter, we give you a clean build health or we determine what you have to take action on or we have to worry about. 
or watch right now, and then we give you sort of a, cont a continuity plan is, is the long term. It may be interesting, Peter, for, for uh, everyone to hear our first 200 clients. They're motivated by a number of things to come and visit us. First of all, their personal health and the health of their family. But also, um, many of our clients want to see this change occur in the healthcare system. And then there's another dimension. Uh, a lot of people really enjoy being part of this intensive exploration of the data that we're collecting and, and, and sort of be a part of this um, next frontier in biology and learning about the early, early adopters yeah. and having a chance to actually help shape where the future yeah. of healthcare is going. There was a question earlier about life insurance. And uh, one of the things that you should know is the life insurance industry is very interested in working with us, uh, not to use this kind of data to preclude someone from getting life insurance, but instead to use this data to help keep their clients alive longer, right? It's a win-win scenario. If, if you're paying a life insurance premium every year and uh, if, if the life insurance company can help you stay alive longer, you pay those premiums and they pay out later and everybody wins. So for that reason, almost every life insurance carrier is like, just excited to be working with us. All right, life insurance that extends life. Yeah, exactly. Next question. Next, uh, you talk a lot about the falling cost of technology. What's your projection about the cost of the health nucleus in the future years and decades? Um, I, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think it's going to come in a couple of dimensions. First, I think there's no reason to, to suspect that, that uh, additional cost is not going to come out of sequencing. So the, the cost of sequencing will continue to decline. Um, the cost of the technology, like Peter talks about, the rest of the technology is going to decline with it. So, so what we're doing in the health nucleus will become increasingly affordable. Um, the other uh, potential that, that we're working on at, at Human Longevity is virtualizing some of the parts of the health nucleus that can be virtualized. Those of you who hear about my six Ds, about dematerializing and right. demonetizing and democratizing, we're having those right. same conversations <laughs> inside of, of that. Right. And, and it's like anything else, right? Uh, we have a limited capacity for those who want to come on, uh, on early. It's... It is relatively expensive. I'm putting my family uh, through it um, because I believe in it. I've gone through it myself. Uh, and eventually, uh, can we knock off a zero off of that? Of course, uh, that will, will come down as the volume goes up. I don't know the time frame on that, but uh, that's what every, every company will, will strive to do. All right. The question about banking your stem cells, uh, is that still a recommendation? So uh, two parts. One is if you know anybody who is pregnant or plans to be pregnant, uh, I think it's critically important for them to bank their stem cells. We have uh, one of the part of HLI is a company um, called LifeBank, and uh, we are one of three major uh, stem cell banking companies. Uh, for I have banked my two sons, uh, banked their placental. Uh, stem cells. The data seems to show that placental is better than uh, than cord blood uh, banking for a number of reasons. Um, but I know folks like Martine Rothblatt, one of our investors, uh, she is doing pioneering work on regrowing lungs and eventually kidneys, livers, hearts from stem cells. So that, um, you know, in the next 10 years, I wouldn't be surprised if based upon placental stem cells uh, that are stored, uh, will regrow organs. Now, in terms of uh, if you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, can you bank your own stem cells? Uh, that's a service we don't offer yet. It's something that we've talked about, um, that one vision of the future, uh, and again, this is theoretical, it's, it's, it is, you know, bank your stem cells today because you'll never be younger, they will never be younger than they are at this moment. Right. And then can we eventually go to a day and age where we take those stem cells, we correct them genetically to their original source code, and then use those to re, uh, uh, as Bob Perry talks about, replenish your, uh, your stem cell population. So uh, that's for sort of, if you would, the next stage of what human longevity will be working on. Today, it's really around the health nucleus. So how will you update each client's results after the initial report? You can talk a little bit about the process of 
constantly updating the data. All right, so we envision an annual update with quarterly review of, of uh, data that are recommended um, that be collected either using blood test, um, microbiome, the stool, or um, uh, imaging testing. So, so we would we would sort of have the year-long experience that culminates with the individual risk assessment and the care plan, and then after that, um, we would have an opportunity to have quarterly review with annual updates beyond. You know, one thing that um, a few of the questions that may be in the queue, uh, but I think are important to address here. Um, and first of all, I just want to point out that if if in watching this, you would like to participate, uh, uh, down on this page under details, on the right-hand side, there is a link. Uh, we are, because we're limited capacity, we're asking you to fill out a, an application. Um, we're gonna be taking that, that details and, uh, and then calling you back or emailing you back um, if, uh, if you fit the criteria to have you register with us. Uh, we can't, again, we're gonna be capacity limited as we start to roll this out. Uh, but if you click on that link, there'll be a, a brief application. We'll just take you five minutes to fill out and then uh, you'll be able to submit that. And then our, our team will get back to you within 24 hours uh, on that. But uh, a few questions, um, Brad, that I think are important to ask is, uh, do people need to come back every year? No, we're, um, we may have some people that need to come back early on because we're running specialized protocols on our MRI machine, but we're working very hard to allow us to have continuity uh, without having people travel to La Jolla on an annual basis. Uh, the second question, and I'm gonna take part of the answer here, is how, if you have a normal, if you have a normal physician, how does your normal doctor be involved? And then the second part, like it answers, if, if you don't have a regular physician, what do you recommend? So I'll give you mine. I went through the health nucleus experience as a paying customer, and uh, I had my doctor, Dr. Todd Spector, actually participate in all the debriefs. So we were debriefed via uh, a WebEx live video, and he was on it, and I was on it, um, and we were able to spend you know a couple hours. And I, I'm a physician as myself, not practicing. Uh, but I asked questions, he asked questions, and we got a full, detailed, digital, and written report. And all this is going to be uh, living digitally on the app and on the web as well. Uh, but uh, it's really a matter of being able to have someone really smart who you interact with uh, be able to be there for the full download as well. Right. And if they don't have a, uh, a physician that they normally use, what do you recommend? Well, so we've been asked by many of our clients to identify a physician that's, that's more prepared than theirs to deal with these data. And so we have developed uh, relationships that allow us to refer to physicians that are beginning to work with this kind of data or these kind of data. And this is a journey not only for our clients, Peter, as you know, but also for physicians that have never dealt with these data and we're working closely with all I mean, of them. I mean, there are, so two things, right? Some people say, listen, I just don't want to know, right? right? I mean, and I, I just, just to be very clear about this, if you fall on the mindset of, I just don't want to know that level of data about myself, I really want you to consider changing that because I think that is um, a bit myopic because having information can save your life, right? Knowing that there is a small cancer growing or they have a cardiovascular issue or even that you have a potential for Alzheimer's, um, you can address those. You can go in, on early uh, changes of diet. You can go on early experimental protocols. There's lots of things. We're living in the most extraordinary time ever of breakthroughs. And, and not knowing, I think, is your, is your biggest danger. On the flip side, there's also doctors who are just, this is too much work. They don't want to be part of it. I don't, you know, let me just check your heart and your lungs and your weight. That is so 19th century, it's scary. So uh, you might want to consider changing doctors bluntly. <laughs> um, another question, uh, Cody? Uh, yeah, so how many genomes have you sequenced so far and what have you learned from them? 
So right now, uh, we've done about 28,000 what we call deep coverage whole genome sequences, which is a magnitude greater than the entire whole world inventory of such sequences. And, and that's giving us, that's extremely important um, because it's giving us the ability to annotate and create new meaning around the genome. So for example, we've never been able to look at the mutability of each base pair location across 28,000 genomes. And it turns out it's extremely variable across those 3.2 billion base pairs. That's already giving us a huge advantage over other people in the field to make important insights about the health of our clients in the health nucleus. Um, so here's a, a question that was pre-sent in and says, what happens if you discover something about a patient during their assessment? Uh, when do they find out about it? And like, what have we done for the first 200 clients? So we, um, anything that's urgent to notify any of our clients about, we do so immediately. Um, and right now the data are coming back in a little bit of a staggered fashion. So if there's something that's urgent to let people know about, we let them know. Uh, otherwise, we have sort of normal intervals where they where we provide information and reports back to people. And then we're also able to hook them up with uh, expert physicians in that area. A absolutely. So we have been working. If we if we find something that needs attention, um, we work with their uh, private physician to immediately find. Um, um, a top specialist to, to deal with that issue. And I think it's important to, to, to build on Peter's comments. The things that we're finding that are new, um, um, they essentially all have some pretty straightforward um, actionability around them. We're not finding things that, well, I can't do anything about that. Um, essentially, um, you know, 98% of our findings are, are, are actionable. I'll give you one example. One of my friends, an Abundance 360 member who went through uh, the health nucleus early, who has an annual checkup, annual chest x-ray, goes to a physician on a regular basis. He's an extremely successful CEO. Uh, we discovered a thymoma uh, growing under his breastplate uh, that he had no idea about. It was still early enough that it was encapsulated. Uh, uh, we reported it Immediately, uh, a week later, he underwent robotic surgery uh, using the Da Vinci robot and uh, was back at work two days after surgery, uh, cured from that cancer. And if it had not been found, right. there is the... Uh, pro so essentially all stage one or early cancers in solid organs are, are curable. Uh, but if you get into stage three and four where they start to spread around the body, becomes a very different outcome for people. And this MRI that we're using has remarkable detection capability, but it's also radiation free. And the format we use is also contrast free. So there's no medical risk associated with the use of this equipment, equipment which really changes yeah. the risk benefit ratio. And, and interestingly enough, people say, well, you know, I remember the doctors were saying, don't look because you're gonna find anomalies and so forth. But that was using such old technology where the resolution right. wasn't anywhere near as right. high. And so we're not finding anomalies now that are unknowable. We're finding actual disease issues. Right. Cody, what you got? Do you imagine the health nucleus will replace hospitals over time as more branches open? Um. I uh, certainly hope to see a large scale transition from our sick care system to one that focuses on keeping people healthier for much longer periods of time. You know, we already have too many hospital beds in this country. So I think, yes, over, over you know, some period of time, we'll see um, more and more emphasis on this kind of care and hopefully a decrease in, in the number of hospital beds we have in the country. Uh, hospitals will be places where you go for a specific action, uh, but not, I mean, so here's the, I mean, it's a very fundamental concept. It right. is if we can determine based on your genomics, what you're likely to die from, uh, to be blunt, right? So the first stage of issues are cardiovascular. The next stage is cancer. The next stage is neurodegenerative. 
And if we can identify what your genomics, because your genome is your health history, I mean, sorry, your health future, it, it gives you the probabilities mixed in with, you know, uh, nurture and your lifestyle, all those things, gives you the probabilities of what is likely to happen to you. And so it tells us what to be looking for early on. And if we can find it and solve it at the earliest stages, it gives you the highest probability of extending your healthy lifespan. I mean, that's Absolutely. just as fundamental as it gets. Absolutely. Will the health nucleus be publishing the results of the data to contribute to medical literature, or will it remain private to the individual? Yeah, we will publish um, um, early and often uh, our results. So we're already uh, preparing a manuscript uh, for about our first 200 clients, of course, completely de-identified. But we think peer review in medical literature is a, is a really important part of the scientific process. And, and I think, honestly, the results are, uh, I would use the word staggering, uh, but I think they're extremely uh, uh, significant. Right. Um, yes. So what is the average time frame you anticipate you can extend the hu healthy human lifespan? Can you talk about longevity for a second? I think it's really, um, we're at a very interesting uh, point in human history. And, um, you know, the platform that human longevity is building is going to be applicable to two dimensions of, of human longevity. One is sort of dealing with immediate health risk, um, which are mostly age-related diseases at this point. But we expect to also find things um, that are actionable in the realm of root causes of human aging. Um, and both of those dimensions of interventions are gonna be natural outcomes of the work we're doing at Human Longevity, and in particularly in the health, health nucleus. Uh, to add to that, because I, I, I think about this, write about this, talk to people a lot about this, uh, you know, the question of why does someone live uh, to age over 100 and have clarity of cognition and great health, um, it has something to do with diet, but honestly, it has a lot to do with genomics. And so we're going to start to understand as we get this large-scale data to understand what allows people to live longer and longer and identify how we provide those attributes to right. you, me, all of you. Uh, the second thing, as Brad said, is just keeping people from dying, right? Again, if that person, if we can move the line on cardiovascular, right. and one of the things we've gotten, a lot of the people who have come through uh, have had, have had uh, unknown heart block issues, have had right. unknown right. arrhythmias, right. Uh, atrial fibrillation that could lead to stroke right. or death. I mean, this is fundamental stuff. These are the same, right. thank you for saving my life emails I've right. gotten. Um, and, then, uh, the, uh, and then finally, as, as the health nucleus moves your life forward, right, it's adding, uh, if we can add 10 years or 20 years to your life there, medical science, is exploding and is bringing about additional. Our friends at Calico, Google's longevity play, are working on uh, pharmaceuticals to extend healthy life. But if they take an extra 10 years, if we extend your life 10 years, then you'll be able to intercept those things. And then Bob Hariri, our third co-founder, who's focused on stem cells, you know, we've learned that as you get older, two things happen. One, the stem cells flowing through your body diminish in number. And the second is they undergo epigenetic changes, so they're not, you're not running the same software you were running as a child. So can we replenish and rejuvenate your stem cell population? These are additional works we're working on, others are working on. Um, and these are the combinations of things that will extend uh, really the healthy human lifespan. And again, the vision is can you have the cognition, you know, the thinking, the mobility, the agility, if you would, and the, uh, and the visual uh, when you're 100 that you had at 60, that's sort of a sort of uh, the way I, I think about it. How does the health nucleus compare to other genome sequencing services out there? Great question. Yeah, I'm not um, aware of anyone that is um, uh, using genomics combined with other clinical data anywhere near this scale. Um, um, 
uh, and with any any uh, resolution of of all of the major causes of age related early mortality. Yeah, I mean the, the best known is Twenty Three and Me. I'm a, a fan of what Adam Wojcicki did. Uh, I'm a customer of Twenty Three and Me as well. But to understand the difference, right? Uh, Twenty Three and Me will will look at a million single nucleotides. So out of the 3.2 billion letters in your life, uh, they'll look at a million of those very specific letters. And um, to tell you certain attributes and certain disease probabilities, we're looking at all 3.2 billion, right? 3,000 times more. And then we're doing massive machine learning on top of that. And then correlating that genomics with all the other phenotypic data, MRI, uh, microbiome that we collect. And that level uh, does not exist anywhere. Yeah. yeah, the real utility of genomics is going to be um, in combination with deep integration with other clinical data in a machine learning environment. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing uh, in the health nucleus. Um, we don't think anybody else globally is doing that. Um, again, if this is something of interest to you, uh, we're going to be rolling this out uh, much to a much broader audience come uh, the fall, uh, end of summer, fall, and, and we'll quickly uh, saturate our capacity. If I wanted to offer this early to, uh, to my community uh, in appreciation for your caring about an abundance and uh, an exponential mindset, and I think about what is scarce and what's abundant you know, time seems to be scarce, but this is one way to increase an abundance of time by lengthening the length of your, your life. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think. Yeah, let's end on a fun one. You talk a lot about moonshots. How soon could you scale this service for everyone on the planet? That's, that's a great question. <laughs> it's coming right back at you, no, Peter. It sure is. <laughs> so, uh, so listen, I think um, we are... Uh, we're in our early re uh, research beta phase, right? We're accommodating six to eight people. We're going to learn. We're going to create a great, we have an amazing quality of service, right? I, I get an email from everybody saying that was the most amazing experience, your eight hours at Health Nucleus. And I think all of our people went through, was it uh, Ritz or Four Seasons uh, training? Right, right. Uh, for, I mean, just, you're going to, if you come through, you're going to say that was a very different medical experience than going to a doctor's office or hospital ever before. But I think we are talking about virtualizing this. We're gonna we're going to dematerialize and demonetize over time. Um, but as a business, we want to do it responsibly. Want to do it safely. Want to do it super high quality. Right? Quality of service is one of the most important things uh, because we're dealing with your health. So as a reminder, under the details section on the right hand side, if you click on uh, on the link. Um, uh, if you click on the link, you'll be able to uh, fill out a simple application and then we'll get back to you if we're able to bring you into the health nucleus. Uh, thank you. I hope that uh, even if you're not going to be a client, this vision of uh, where the future is going has helped you get excited about the perspective for health, right? Because I remember someone, uh, Joe Polish, told me something. The person who has his health has a thousand dreams. The person who does not has but one. And I thought about that a lot, right? Because um, there is nothing more valuable than your health. And if we can help you extend it, um, remember when you end up at the hospital, something wrong, it didn't happen that morning. It's been going on for months, for years. And the stats were getting at 33% or a third of the people coming through the health nucleus finding something pretty staggering and pretty important. We'll be publishing that, we'll be sharing it with you. Thank you for joining us today. Brad, a pleasure yeah. as always, Brad. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Have you. a great day.